Now, let's talk for broad audience. One thing people imagine, there are two famous misconceptions of non-mathematicians about mathematics. One is that mathematics is complicated. It's not the case. We all know it's the world which is complicated. That's why the title of this conference is perfect, Mathematics in a Complex World. And however hard mathematics we do and uh, solve, it will always be uh, monster simplifications of the complexity of reality. And the second uh, misconception is that mathematics is some old subject that has been closed hundreds of years ago, and uh, we learned this in high school and so on. And of course, we all know it's uh, completely false and that every year there are several hundreds of thousands of uh, new theorems proven all around the world. Now, mathematics uh, still is something a bit uh, special among sciences. And to explain to lay audience, sometimes I use this picture. This uh, is representation of the Lady of Shalott. It's this uh, dam from the uh, time of King Arthur. It is uh, evoked in a beautiful poem by uh, Tennyson. And uh, she is... Uh, she is struck by some curse for whatever reason. And uh, the curse is that she can see reality only through reflection. There is the mirror here. Uh, in the tale, then, it's uh, very sad. At some point came, comes a uh, handsome Lancelot, and he's so beautiful that she has to see him directly. So she breaks the curse, then she dies, and so on. It's very sad. And there are many comments about the poem, which is uh, very nice. There is a beautiful song that was made of it. Uh, and people wonder what is the significance of the poem and so on, many interpretations that are possible. I like to think it's an allegory of the mathematician. The mathematician cannot see the world directly, but can only work on the reflection, which is the mathematical equations. And uh, as the reflection is a bit of a pale, uh, image of the world, and that's why she has to see Lancelot with her own eyes directly, not through the, the mirror. We also have to work on these pale reflections that are the equations. And though it's still something very rich, so that's one thing about mathematics, work on abstract models, the equations, the formulas, even when they are inspired by reality. Now, one of these other claims that we know is false, uh, that mathematics would be closed, is uh, the fact that we know very well that there are many problems that have been open for a long time. Sometimes you find new solutions to some problems. As a general rule, though, the number of open problems is an increasing function of time. Because each time you solve the problem, there are several new open problems which appear, and uh, more than problems that you solve. And uh, some of these problems are very famous. And uh, here we see also something interesting in mathematics. So the problem here I mentioned is, of course, the Riemann hypothesis. I OK, here I put a, a bit of a spectacular subtitle, never mind. And uh, we know Riemann hypothesis can be explained in the language of complex analysis with the zeros of the zeta function. And uh, where they lie, are they aligned, and so on. Or we can explain it in a much more fuzzy way, which is also true. The fact that uh, uh, prime numbers are distributed in some sense completely randomly, with fluctuations that are exactly given by some formula from probability. They are not evenly distributed, because they become rarefied and rarefied as a uh, uh, number increases. But uh, they are fluctuate in a way that is quite random when you look at statistics. And uh, it's very interesting for several reasons. First, this is a problem everybody agrees is uh, fantastic. There's a million bucks on the head of this uh, problem. But I'm sure many of you in the room would gladly pay one million bucks to solve it. <laughs> and uh, now, another thing that is interesting is that this hypothesis as a conjecture has been checked on billions and billions on uh, examples, on zero. In any other field than mathematics, it would be considered uh, truth. It would be considered a done deal. But for mathematicians, even uh, experimental evidence, even if it is billions of, uh, of positive checks, is not sufficient. Because we only trust logical reasoning. 
And that's the other uh, second thing that is completely distinctive of mathematics. Only trust in uh, uh, logical reasoning. It's a kind of supreme form of uh, scientific scepticism. It is still science, but you put, push some of the principles to their extreme. Now, this makes people fantasize a bit, and you see here there was this uh, Guardian article some time ago saying that it could bring doom to internet if this uh, conjecture is solved. Why on earth did the journalists write this? Well, because uh, he understands that this is a problem about prime numbers, and that prime numbers are interesting for encryption, so for coding messages and security and so on. So he thinks if we solve the Riemann hypothesis, we can break coding algorithms more efficiently. Of course, it's nonsense. Precisely, Riemann hypothesis says that uh, prime numbers are randomly, randomly spaced, so what on earth could it uh, help uh, factorizing the big numbers? Of course, it's, it's, it's uh, absurd. This shows also that it's hard to convey uh, science and to explain it to journalists. However, uh, you can feel the enthusiasm still that is in this uh, journalist paper. Now, Riemann is a very good start for our story, for my story. I gave a rather strange title, as you saw, and uh, Riemann will be one of, the, one of the heroes in our story. Riemann, among many other great achievements, developed the Riemannian geometry. Okay, better. Riemann developed the Riemannian geometry, which is a generalization of the Euclidean geometry. Euclidean geometry is flat, with the basic things being angles and lines. Angles, length, and lines, which are the shortest path between two points, say in a plane or in space. And uh, it was a big topic in the 19th century to extend this to more general geometries. One of the key players was Gauss, and uh, he introduced some important ways to look, to understand geometry. And uh, Riemann, who was his student, kind of founded a new way to look at it, and uh, made the definition still used today, what is the framework to do non-Euclidean geometry. This was Riemannian geometry. Riemannian geometry is a world which is like our world, but it's distorted. At each location, you allow variations in unit of length, so it may be longer or shorter, and also the angles may change. In technical terms, you choose your quadratic form at each point in the space that allows you to define angles and lengths. And then, of course, if it's distorted, like you want to do geometry on a sphere or on whatever surface you have, battle, whatever, of course, you cannot speak of a line. But if you have length, you can still define what is the length of a curve, and you can still define uh, certain particular curves to be minimizers of the length between two points. These are the geodesics. This is the natural generalization of a line. Shortest paths in this world, of course, are not straight. They are curved, as they are on, uh, in our world uh, on the Earth. If you look at a very good way to see this materialize is to look at the trajectories of planes on a, on a map of the world, and you see how they are curved to minimize the length. Now, besides describing, in mathematics, we have to understand, of course, and uh, classify things, say things are of this species, that species, and find some quantities, some numbers, which help you understand the complexity of this world. One of these amazing achievements, still the basis of Riemannian geometry, is the notion of curvature. I will not define it uh, precisely here. Uh, I will only draw pictures, uh, show pictures for two dimensions, uh, as case of surfaces. And uh, then the notion of curvature is the one that was already introduced by Gauss. And uh, this curvature you can understand as a way to describe the speed at which geodesics separate. If we are in a flat space, geodesics separate in a way that is proportional to the length. If you are in a positively curved world, geodesics separate slower. Like here on the Earth, if you look at two distinct geodesics emanating from North Pole, they will meet again once in South Pole. Very different from our experience of the Euclidean world. If you meet once, you never meet again. You separate and never see each other again. 
while on the Earth you do uh, see each other again. It's an indication that you don't separate fast. Another way to see it is that in positive curvature, that's like the sphere, triangles are fatter than the Euclidean triangles. For instance, the sum of the angles is always more than 180 degrees. In this case, uh, with three straight angles, it is 270 degrees. And uh, it can be even more, of course. On the contrary, in the world of negative curvature, like hyperbolic space, you see here, this is a model of hyperbolic space. This is famous picture by drawing by Escher. The units of length change, so all these fish, in fact, have the same dimension. They're all isometric. And uh, you see here, there are some approximations of the geodesics. And uh, here in this world, the triangles are, on the contrary, skinner, skinnier than the triangles of the Euclidean world. And the sum of angles is less than 180 degrees and so on. Uh, negative curvature is very fascinating, in particular because there is no model as concrete as the sphere uh, that we can see in our three-dimensional space to be a constant negative curvature space. We can have approximations, though, and uh, sometimes with singularity lines, and this negative curvature uh, world is full of beautiful shapes and curves. I mean the mathematical shapes, of course. Here, <laughs> you see, uh, these are this one and this one are pictures taken from the Hyperbolic Reef Museum in Dublin, in which they do this hyperbolic knitting that you see here and here, which is just uh, an approximation of uh, negatively curved, constantly negatively curved, uh, let's say, tissue. This is a shape that is obtained from the study of a nonlinear Schrodinger equation. It's some attractor for a finite dimensional dynamics which describes its asymptotic state that is, for, that is in technical words. Just look how nice it is. It is also negative curvature constant, except for these singularity lines, which are compulsory if you want to have an object that is embedded in our three-dimensional space. This one is another example. It's the pseudosphere, uh, also negatively curved, constant negatively curved. And uh, this one uh, has a singularity here. Uh, this one was displayed in the Fondation Cartier pour l'art contemporain, uh, showing that this kind of object is fascinating to artists, too. Now, this shows also, these examples show how mathematics can be felt as beautiful. And then the same way as there was an attempt of uh, defining what is a good uh, piece of music, it's something you want to hear again, we can say something is artistic if it inspires artists, and that's an example that fits the definition. Um, it is not just artistic, it is also very useful, as we know. And this combination of art and useful is also a distinctive feature of mathematics. On the basis of uh, the Riemann curvature, defined for any dimension and world, Ricci and others introduced other notions of curvature derived from the Riemann curvature, which turned out to be absolutely critical for the development of the Einstein general relativity theory. We see here how, after about a half century, something which is pure mathematics becomes an important object in the physical description of the world. And that's uh, the time when Einstein completely changed his view of mathematics, saying, before I thought it was just, just people thinking for pleasure. Now I understand how important it is for my job, too. And now, as we know also, it is fundamental to use this general relativity corrections uh, in order to have accurate GPS, GPS uh, prescriptions, GPS uh, uh, indications. So in a way, in each of our GPS, there is a bit of Riemann, a bit of Ricci, a bit of Einstein. You can check by opening it and see inside. Riemann was remarkable in observing the world around and trying to discover um, some regularities, some uh, singularities, some shapes in various contexts. For instance, he also was one of the first interested in describing shocks. 
in compressible fluid dynamics. The kind of uh, shocks that we can see uh, due to some reflection of the lights, how is it that there is a cusp appearing here, how is it that there is a uh, here for a supersonic plane we can see some discontinuities in the velocities of the fluid around or here this one is less poetic maybe it's a Kalashnikov you know and this is sending a bullet and you see here these beautiful waves that are formed these shocks that are in the wake of the bullet this is the kind of thing that Riemann also tried to understand in relation to physics and gas and fluids in fact uh, it's rather frightening when you look at the list of topics named after Riemann and you contrast this uh, with, the, with the short life that he had, uh, only 40 years old when he died. So Riemann is a perfect example, uh, the, the story is perfect example of uh, the various ways in which you can do history of science, either focusing on some project or some problems or focusing on the history of concepts and how one concept will grow and be passed from mathematician to mathematician and so on, or the history of people and uh, what happened to them, their personal life, sometimes tragic, sometimes very happy and so on. A very inspiring character. Actually, once I met a famous uh, rock singer who told me she liked to go from time to time over the grave of Riemann to meditate. Uh, it can, in this way, we see also we can be proud in a way that the big, the great mathematicians are so full of inspiration for all kinds of people. Graves are very inspiring, actually. I know this too. And this is a picture that was taken uh, in 2006 in Vienna in the Central Cemetery at a time when we were commemorating the 100th anniversary of the tragic suicide of Boltzmann. So, on the grave, you can see here one of the most famous formulas in, in physics, a formula that has a lot of content, like E is mc square and so on. It uh, reminds us of the, oh yes, by the way, by the way, the formula in this way was uh, written by Planck, uh, first in this form. We heard in the beautiful lecture of Peter, he was speaking of Planck as a kind of uh, prophet. And there was like in this lecture, Planck said these words and so on. Also Planck found the perfect uh, syntax for the Boltzmann formula behind the entropy. So let us take some time, this will be a second story, to evoke the amazing contributions of physicists at that time, around 1860, which was the time of a revolution in physics. Revolution that was not less important than later the revolution of quantum mechanics. It was a statistical revolution. A bit more messy maybe than the quantum revolution, but still of no, no lesser importance. So at this time where atoms were just an assumption, an hypothesis, and would remain so for 50 years more, at this time, there was the idea to model a gas as an enormous amount of particles interacting, colliding each other, using the holy laws of Newton to describe the motions of these particles and uh, derive physical conclusions on this basis. It was not the first time that people were thinking of matter as made of atoms, of course, but it was the first time that people were really pushing through this very deeply to find some conclusions that maybe could be confronted with experiment and so on, some predictions, some uh, deep predictions. The two main heroes in this uh, revolution were Boltzmann and uh, Maxwell. We heard already about Maxwell in a previous talk as a uh, uh, founding father of chaos paradigm, uh, in, as they know this in England. Of course, in France, we are taught from kindergarten that chaos is due to Poincaré and Adamar. <laughs> OK, that's the way it is often. Now, what Boltzmann and Maxwell did was uh, 
build up on this idea that we don't want to represent all the billions and billions or billions of billions of particles that make us, that make up a gas, like a gas in this room or gas in the atmosphere. We don't care, first we cannot, and second we don't care about all these particles. Only thing we care about is the statistics. What is the proportion of particles going left, proportion of particles going right, and so on. And so, in this new representation, new description of the world, we don't think of the positions and particles and velocities of particles, we just think of the statistics of it, depending on the position, but also on the velocity. Because if we want to predict the future of one particle, you need to know its position and its velocity. It's the same with many particles. We need to know all positions and all velocities. Or if we want a statistical description, we need the statistics in position and velocity space. This is the reason for the word kinetic theory. This, of course, was not just coming out of the blue. Like all revolutions in science, it was building on previous work. The kinetic theory, as developed by Maxwell and Boltzmann, takes place in several other scientific movements. One was the development of thermodynamics. We'll see later the relation. The other one was the continuous progress of the laws of probability and statistics. Let's uh, remind, recall that probability in modern sense uh, essentially start uh, around 1700 with statistics. Here, it's of course an exaggeration, since there were previously the important works done by the mathematicians of the 17th century. But then you have things like laws or law of large numbers, which start to be attacked explicitly by Bernoulli. It's an enormous change of mentality for mankind. Before that, randomness is something you cannot predict. Will it rain or not? We don't know. No way to tell. And then you understand that maybe if, even if you can't predict what will happen this day or on this particular occasion, you can predict the statistics and slide slowly mastering this idea of chance. And uh, you toss your coin a billion times. You don't uh, know for each of the tossings if it will be head or tails. But uh, you have the idea that on average it will be 50-50, 50% for each. Uh, around 1730, Abraham de Moivre discovers an important, uh, exceptionally important actor in this game, the Gaussian law. De Moivre is very good because he can be claimed both by the French and the English. Actually, he was a French Huguenot who, was, uh, who had to escape from France because in those days, okay, they were a bit crazy for relative to certain issues. And uh, he found a uh, home in uh, London and was one of the most important and prominent uh, specialists of probability at the time. And he discovered this curve, this bell-shaped curve, the Gaussian, that is one of the most fascinating objects in mathematics for the universality with which it appears in probabilistic concepts for all kinds of very unrelated events. One of, the, uh, one of the most striking manifestations of the sentence of Poincaré according to which mathematics is giving the, name, the same name to two different concepts. Gaussian law is everywhere and we see here how uh, an abstract concept can be embodied in uh, a large number of concrete examples. A bit later in France, Buffon comes up with this uh, famous needle experiment. I'm afraid there is some compatibility problem with the projector, so you should see a line here and a line here. And uh, this is like, you know, there are parallel lines. Ah, on the other one it works. Very good. On the left wing it works, on the right wing no. No political allusion, okay. <laughs> so, here, there is this, you, you send this needle, and in this uh, case, the needle has just the same length as the distance between two consecutive lines. And this is beautiful experiment. You put your, you, you, you let your needle fall down and down again and again and again, millions of times, uh, in all kinds of possible ways, and if you do it completely randomly, 
on average, the proportion of times that the needle will cross a line will be 2 over pi. Notice the geometric nature of the problem, obviously, which is emphasized by this pi here. So here this is an example that probability can go well with geometry. And later it was discovered that probability can also go well with physics, for instance, and so on. In 1810, Pierre-Simon de Laplace proves what would be possible to call maybe the most uh, uh, important theorem in mathematics. Maybe this has no meaning to say which is the most important, but if there is one, this one would, uh, would be a good candidate. That if you take a large number of random and correlated experiments, take the statistical mean, then it behaves like a random variable, of course, but it becomes more and more deterministic as the number of experiments goes. That is law of large numbers. It concentrates around the mean. The speed of concentration is 1 over square root of n. That's the typical width. And uh, in the limit, it is like a Gaussian, like this bell-shaped curve, under assumptions that are extremely weak and that I will not recall here. This was a very difficult, considered an extremely difficult theorem. The Laplace worked very hard on this. His proof was not totally rigorous, but was the first one approaching something rigorous. Adolf Kittele, a few decades later, makes this law of random causes popular in the field of social sciences. And uh, I told you probability later, it was discovered, goes well with physics. But by some interesting accident, it was first matched with social sciences. And uh, people like Ketele, uh, later it would be Galton, people at the time of Ketele, for instance, they would count statistics for murder in this or that city, or the size of uh, people, distribution of all kinds of things related to human, to human race. You would think, what the hell is it with uncorrelating variables? We don't see this. But see, they, they find this, uh, these Gaussian correlations appearing. You can say crimes in a city, maybe all the murderers are uncorrelated, and so on. Uh, Ketele asks some philosophical questions about this. If you can predict what will be the average number of, uh, number of crimes in this or that city, doesn't it raise concern about freedom, and so on? Uh, Galton found this uh, wonderful sentence at the end of the 18th cen uh, 19th century, the supreme law of unreason. I know of scarcely anything so apt to impress the imagination as the wonderful form of cosmic order expressed by the law of frequency of error. The law would have been personified by the Greeks and deified if they had known of it. It reigns with serenity and in complete self-effacement amid the wildest confusion. The huger the mob and the greater the apparent anarchy, the more perfect its sway. It is the supreme law of unreason. Whenever a large sample of chaotic elements are taken in hand and marshaled in the order of their magnitude, an unsuspected and most beautiful form of regularity proves to have been latent all along. Beautifully said. And this uh, idea that we've been now acquainted with, also in the context of dynamical systems, that the unpredictability of individual events goes well with the predictability of the statistics. Back to Boltzmann. This is a picture of young Boltzmann. A Boltzmann comes in this framework of ideas takes the sequel and introduces other concepts that are tremendously important. Entropy. Entropy is something that is as deep as it is simple. When you are observing a system with a set of experiments, with your senses, with some things you can measure, but not observing the complete state of the system, there are some things that you will never be able to know. If you observe somebody from the outside, you can never know what are, the, what, what are its inner structures. Uh, OK, there was some comment in a previous talk about beauty and symmetry, whatever. But uh, even if you have somebody perfectly symmetric, the organs inside will not be symmetric, and so on. 
if you observe a gas from the outside, all experiments you can do are of statistical nature. You can put your hand and feel the pressure. You can put some detector and count how many times the particles go right or left, etc. But with your macroscopic devices, you will never be able to measure the individual velocities of particles. So that's why we replace the precise Newtonian description of the particles by the statistical description in which the only object is this distribution of particles in the position velocity space. There is a reduction in the precision, so there is some unknown, some uncertainty when you observe the system. That uncertainty you measure. If it's uh, of combinatorial nature, it will be a number of possibilities. If it is continuous, it will be a volume of possibilities for some natural measure in the problem. This number measuring the uncertainty you call W, you take its logarithm, which measures the number of uh, characters you need to write this uncertainty with a number. You multiply by some physical constant, and this is your entropy. S is K times the logarithm on the number of possibilities. Boltzmann found this, but with this it would just have remained an abstract concept not so useful in practice. It's important before we go on that we notice that entropy is not an intrinsic concept of matter. If uh, you measure the entropy of a gas as macroscopic beings, or if you become a tiny particle and go and explore the gas, uh, it will not be the same entropy. Entropy depends on the observer, on the scale, on the discretization or on the uh, continuous representation that you are, have. At quantum level, of course, the entropy would be completely different. Boltzmann shows that if you are on such a scale that you describe your system by a probability density, then you can compute the entropy with some approximation and there is this workable formula minus integral of f times log of f. And you integrate over the phase space. This was extremely important. The abstract definition becomes more concrete. You can use it as an engineer. You can use it in physicist reasoning. You can use it in proofs and so on. The passing from one to the other is based on a nice combinatorial example uh, exercise that you can solve with the Stirling formula, for instance. And uh, it's just an exercise, but also it's very deep. It is the basis also of what is known in theory of large deviations as the Sanoff theorem. With Boltzmann, we understand important laws and new ways to see natural world. For instance, Boltzmann has this idea that what is more frequent, what has more possibilities, will happen in a more likely way. And uh, this can be measured with the entropy. Take a gas, for instance, that you put in a compartment of a box. You take a big box, you divide it in two halves, you put gas in one half and uh, emptiness void in the other one and you let the gas free to do whatever he wants. After some time, the gas, as we know, will uh, fill the whole of the box. We know there will be some, uh, uh, some thrust, the gas will invade the box, and we like to think that the void has some power of attraction, the power of uh, uh, attraction of the void. Boltzmann tells us it's not, nothing to do with the force of attraction or suction. It's just that there are much more possibilities to fill the entire box because each particle has a possibility which is twice as large. It, takes, um, it gives much more possibilities than if you just stay in the half of the box. So he gives just a combinatorial explanation behind the fact that uh, uh, the gas will fill the whole box. To take an analogy in social sciences or social observation, you can uh, take uh, children in a school, like in a very elementary school, and they are out of the classroom. Maybe they are very ordered at the beginning or in one corner of the recreation uh, hall. Recreation, la uh, cour de récréation, I'm not sure, was the courtyard where they play, right? And uh, 
yes, uh, playground. They are on the playground in one corner of the playground. And after just a few minutes, they will be scattered everywhere. It's not that they are attracted by empty spaces. It's just that they do random things, small groups independently of other groups. And so they will, just by chance, fill the whole of the courtyard. So there is this power of the probability to explain also fluid mechanics that Boltzmann feels. You can raise an objection saying, if it's just a probabilistic thing or combinatorial thing, there should be the possibility that the gas does not always do this, and that it should sometimes stay in half of the box. This actually never occurs and is never observed and will never be observed because of the numbers involved. Each particle has two times as uh, possibilities uh, with uh, filling the whole space than filling half of the space. Now, for each particle, this is a factor of two in the number of possibilities. If you have 10 to the 20 particles, think of the number 2 to the 10 to the 20, which will be the ratio of volumes corresponding. 2 to the 10 to the 20 is number so absurdly large that there is no way our brain can represent it. Uh, I like to compare it with the ratio of the volume of the galaxy to the volume of, uh, of a proton. And uh, the ratio of the ga volume of a galaxy to the volume of a proton is nothing, almost zero compared to that number, 2 to the 10 to the 20. Uh, you would have to yeah, make blow-ups of proton into galaxy like hundreds of billions of times. Now, Boltzmann was able to use his discovery of entropy in conjunction with uh, another field. Before that, we were in probability and combinatorics. Now he combines this with arguments coming from the field of partial differential equations. This is a gallery of partial differential equations. Because this is a talk for lay audience, I will uh, ask people to just look at them in an artistic way here. And uh, these are all nice symbols. Look at the beautiful integrals and so on. <laughs> and they uh, represent also nice uh, objects and ni nice concepts. This one is the Boltzmann equation describing dilute gas on which uh, I uh, spent something like 10 years of my life and was very happy to do so. It was my uh, PhD subject. And uh, it describes uh, the evolution of the density of particles in a dilute gas. F here is the same as the statistics distribution we saw before. And uh, using only the fact that particles collide from time to time. This one is the other main hero in kinetic theory, the Vlasov equation, which describes, for instance, the statistics of electrons in a plasma or the statistics of stars in a galaxy. It is a beautiful thing that the same equation can be used at such different scales. Imagine the difference between the scale of an electron and the scale of a star. However, the same equation will describe the statistics in one case and in the other. Think that there are hundreds of billions of stars in a galaxy after all. Just you have to change one sign because electrons repel each other while stars attract each other. Here are other famous specimens of partial differential equations. In the previous beautiful lecture by Peter Markovich, we saw how some of them describe so accurately or in such beautiful qualitative way some features in nature. For instance, there was this one, one of the examples of uh, reaction diffusion equation. And we had the beautiful pictures of the, of the spots of the giraffe, but also it corresponds to this beautiful equation. Here, this is the Euler equation for incompressible inviscid fluids, one of the older members in this family, 1755 or something like this. Still one of the most dreaded in this whole gang. Sometimes these uh, differential equations have acquired a considerable importance, practical use. Like Navier-Stokes equations are used every day to predict, to forecast the weather. And sometimes they are used to solve problems that are internal to mathematics. Like uh, the Ricci flow, which was used by Grigory Perelman, following uh, the previous work of Richard Hamilton, to prove the Qu Poincaré conjecture. Here, this is the Schrodinger equation. 
uh, as uh, Peter studied it. Uh, this one I photographed on an art on an artistic uh, on an art of work which is at display in the subway in Paris. So it does inspire artists too. What did Boltzmann do with this? Boltzmann combined this equation, Boltzmann equation, telling about the evolution of the gas, with his definition of entropy. And he computed how the entropy will change in time for the gas. And he found this beautiful uh, discovery, entropy can only go up. Of course, there are assumptions, as always. It should be in a closed area. Uh, the system should be isolated. Uh, the system should be elastic. It doesn't work if the system is uh, inelastic. But if you have all these conditions, entropy will always go up. This was a remarkable achievement of which Boltzmann was extremely proud because it was connecting kinetic theory with the second law of thermodynamics. Second law of thermodynamics tells us that entropy only increases, but it was a law, something that you accept without being able to discuss it, to contest it. Now with Boltzmann, it becomes a theorem. A theorem is something that you trust only because you can see the proof. It was a giant conceptual leap. Even though the Boltzmann equation describes only a tiny fraction of natural phenomena, irreversible phenomena. For this reason, Boltzmann equation is extremely famous in theoretical physics. Also, it was one of the first instances in which you can make an important qualitative prediction, macroscopic prediction, starting from a microscopic description, fitting perfectly the paradigm that uh, later Perrin would, uh, would make, saying, uh, uh, in atomistic theory, we want to explain complicated phenomena on our scale by simple phenomena at a microscopic scale. So to show that entropy goes up, you take the expression of the entropy, you differentiate it with time, so I put a dot here, and you compute, use formulas, work on it, and compute the amount of entropy that is dissipated at each instant of time, the rate of production of entropy. And uh, it's easy to see, even though the expression is a bit cumbersome, that it is always non-negative, because a minus b log of a over b is always non-negative, whatever real numbers a and b you put. Now, you can continue the reasoning. And uh, this is also remarkable as and it was well uh, exemplified by the talk of uh, Peter Markovich. It's one of the first examples in which you use an auxiliary functional, here entropy, to predict what will occur of the solution of the equation. Boltzmann equation is complicated. Even for specialists, it's considered a small monster. How can you predict the large time behavior, the observed behavior in the equation? Ah, God knows. But Boltzmann has this idea. Let us look at the entropy. Entropy only increases. Let us bet that the only important things are conservation laws, like energy is conserved, and the entropy increases. And let us look for the state which has the highest entropy under this assumption of conserved energy. And what does he find? The Gaussian distribution again. As in the classical probability theory, Gaussian distribution appears from a completely unrelated reasoning. Beautiful. Gaussian distribution, by the way, can be explained also in probability by means of an entropic reasoning. And certainly this is a deeper explanation than the proof of uh, Laplace or the modern proofs based on Fourier transform. Uh, with this, you see all kinds of problems that people can start to study from mathematical point of view. And there are hundreds and hundreds of papers on Boltzmann equation and on entropy production. As was mentioned in the introduction, one of the pushes for a, a certain trend in this uh, business was given by the Cercignani conjecture. This is a picture of Carlo Cercignani. And uh, this conjecture was made in the beginning of the 80s, that uh, there would be a relation between the production of entropy, the rate of production of entropy, and the distance from your state to the maximum entropy state, which is the Gaussian. Distance that would be measured just in the difference of the entropies. Since this, here on the left-hand side, 
is up to a constant, the time derivative of the right-hand side, if such a quantity, if such an inequality were true, we would have a differential inequality on the rate of production of entropy that would imply a precise quantitative hold of the time it takes to reach equilibrium or very close to it. That's the kind of question that uh, mathematicians like to ask. OK, I have the equation. My physicist friend knows that it will converge to equilibrium, but how long does it take? Uh, I don't want a precise number, but I want to understand the factors, the physical factors that will influence this speed of convergence. Maybe higher density is better. Maybe circular shape is better. Or maybe on the contrary, it should be elongated shape of the container. Maybe it's important to have this or that fluid effect coming here. Maybe it's related to this other problem, etc. And that's a, a problem that was just a two-page proof. It will converge to equilibrium. Becomes a hundred-page problem. Uh, how are those different factors that will influence the speed of convergence and so on? And the uh, Chetimi conjecture was, was the first brick in uh, solving this problem. Take a smooth solution of the Boltzmann equation. What can you say about the speed of convergence? So with Giuseppe Toscani, as was mentioned, I worked on this at the end of the 90s. And we showed that the Chetimi conjecture is almost true. Just you have to put to here a power that is arbitrarily close to 1. At least we proved this for some of the kernels, some of the interactions. Later, I extended this to all interactions. And uh, I also showed, this is one of my very favorite papers, actually, that uh, the Chertinelli conjecture is true when the kernel here grows like quadratic of the relative velocity. Uh, so yes, here I just put in writing some of these themes that you can ask, how fast does entropy increase, and so how fast does the gas become Gaussian? Again, it's a purely mathematical problem inspired from physical considerations. So I worked for a long time on this kind of problems. Uh, other types of problems also in Boltzmann equation, but this entropy increase was one of my very favorite. Boltzmann inspired researchers like me, physicists, mathematicians, many people. I mentioned he committed suicide in 1906, but his work was inspirational uh, for, maybe it will remain inspirational forever, but for many famous people after his death. Albert Einstein, of course. Claude Shannon rediscovered the Boltzmann formula in his theory of communication that we use every day without noticing on our cell phones and whatever. Uh, Smolchowski and Einstein understood how the work of Boltzmann and the atomic hypotheses were related to Brownian motion. Brownian motion actually uh, shows what Boltzmann doubted it would ever be possible to have, a macroscopic manifestation of atomistic fluctuations. Here, this is Carlo Cercignani, his beautiful uh, reference books. That book, The Boltzmann Equation and Its Application, is the first uh, research level books that I read in my life. Of course, you always uh, keep some tenderness for such things. Uh, Mark Katz, famous probabilist, who said that the work of Boltzmann is one of the most important in all the history of sciences, and his book is one of the most important ones. And Jean Perrin, the father of the, uh, the one who brought atoms to consensus, making synthesis of many different experiments. Boltzmann equation is not only for theoretical physics, it's also very practical. And it is used, for instance, in the industry to predict the behavior of gas, like in motors and so on, that you put in cars. So again, you see how some theoretical, um, theoretical thinking can bring to uh, applications long, long later. This was my second story. And uh, I insist on this. We all know this gap that can be between the theory and the applications. The applications in physics, in engineering, but also in mathematics. And entropy turned out to be amazingly powerful concept in mathematics later, all throughout the 20th century. It is fundamental in compressible fluid mechanics, for instance, for selecting physically relevant solutions uh, when you have shocks. As I already mentioned, together with the Fisher information, it is a key element in the information theory. As I uh, also evoked, it is also possible to use entropy 
to derive a law of error, central limit theorem for experts, which is quantitative, based on this entropy principle. And in this way, kind of unify the law of uh, errors and the law of the Boltzmann equilibrium. But also, it played a key role in two of the most famous results about partial differential equations uh, since uh, in the past 100 years. One was the Nash uh, theorem of regularity of non-smooth diffusion equations. In this country, uh, of course, it's important to recall that De Georgi proved the same theorem at the same time with a completely different method, which did not use entropy. And in the, but in the Nash theory, you can see this use of the entropy and uh, the ideas of Boltzmann. Actually, I heard, I, I, I learned with amazement that uh, the concept of entropy was given to Nash by Carlson. Carlson knew it because he had uh, been working on the book, uh, the unfinished book by Kahneman. Kahneman was the first mathematician who tried to devise a mathematical theory for the Boltzmann equation in the 30s. So we see here how ideas go from person to person, from Boltzmann to Kahneman, from Kahneman to Carlson, from Carlson to Nash. And here we have this theorem solved that seems to have nothing with the Boltzmann equation. And also, Perelman used an, amazing, an amazingly clever entropy formula, actually a kind of combination of Fisher information and uh, Boltzmann entropy, to prove the Poincaré conjecture. Other people used uh, the entropy to establish hydrodynamic limits, even in context that is not gas uh, dynamics. And uh, one of the most amazing developments, uh, Voiculescu, used entropy, adapted the definition of Boltzmann to the non-commutative setting to classify, to solve some problem in the classification of two one factors, which are some of the bricks in fun, the theory of von Neumann algebras. Here there is no relation whatsoever, even with physics, or very, very remote. I will mention, and I will go back to it at the end of the talk, that it is also the basis of defining the heat equation in a metric measure space, a very unsmooth space a priori. I call this AGS theory for Ambrosio Gili Savare. Uh, Giuseppe Savare uh, here is one of the people who played uh, such an important role in an amazing series of works uh, showing how one can make sense of heat equation when you don't have a Laplace operator, don't have even a smooth space, just metric and measure, and some bounds involving entropy. Let's turn to a third story. This is the story of Leonid Kantorovich. Again, there will be this mix of theory and applications, and Kantorovich exemplifies this in a monster way by his work. Kantorovich, it was his uh, 100th anniversary. It would have been his 100th anniversary last year. He was, what the hell is this? Okay. Kantorovich was uh, working in the communist times. Uh, he was uh, recognized both uh, as a great uh, theoretician and a great uh, applied scientist. He worked in problems like partly ordered spaces from a very pure, so to speak, way, but also on very concrete problems like atomic bomb or taxi fares. I heard this, that at some point the fares in uh, taxis in Moscow were revolutionized, and that was because the team of Kantorovich had devised what would be the best algorithm to satisfy customers and the drivers. He also worked on numeric approximation, calculators, and so on. He was uh, spanning a whole bunch of areas. His masterpiece, 1959, uh, coming 20 years after a first draft, is the best uses of economic resources. For this work and the mathematics he developed, he was awarded Nobel Prize in Economics in 1975. In a sense, it was the first time that an active mathematician was recognized Nobel Prize in Economics for some mathematics contribution, mathematical research. Uh, he was also uh, very much devoted to serving his country at a time when it was not easy for scientists to do so. You know, best economists of this time could easily be killed in those days in the uh, Soviet Union, just because uh, he was right, for instance. 
And uh, Kantorovich was very, still he was very, he was very daring, had this idea that it's important to organize better the economics in Soviet Union, otherwise we lo they lose the war and so on. There is a book, by the way, about him recently. It's called The Red Plenty by uh, Francis Pufford. I, I recommend this. The story of Kantorovich and his ideas. Uh, the life of Kantorovich, the mathematical life of Kantorovich, was strongly influenced by a chance encounter someday. This is Kantorovich. Uh, okay, another way to represent him. <coughs> now, at some time, it was a problem about plywood. You know, plywood is like this. You have to put uh, several woods together in layers. It's the father of uh, Alfred Nobel, who is considered the inventor of this technique. And uh, one day, as Kantorovich was uh, still very young, but already the head of his department, come these guys from the plywood industry, and they say, Professor Kantorovich, I have this pro we have this problem. Uh, we extract wood from this and that forest. We cut it. We send it to the cutting machine. And there is the gluing machine, etc. What We have many choices, because there are several qualities of wood. We can send part of this here, part of this there. Our machine here can handle that quantity of food. This one can handle this quantity. What is the best way for us to operate? What is the best algorithm? We would call this nowadays a problem in operational research. And uh, they come and ask, what, uh, how, how do we compute this? Kantorovich doesn't know, but he thinks and thinks. And uh, he understands he should not focus on this particular problem, plywood and so on, but instead find the essence, the mathematical essence of the problem. This gave birth to linear programming. Uh, Kantorovich is one of the three inventors of linear programming, which is this, a, gen a set of tools in which you solve problems that are defined by linear constraints. We do this in high school. Uh, I, hope, I hope kids still do it in high school. Uh, you, you, set a, you give a set of constraints given by given by linear functions, so in if you have two, two parameters, uh, this would be lines. This gives you an admissible zone. So one constraint says uh, one machine cannot handle more than two times uh, this and two times that of wood and wood, etc. And uh, on all this, you look what is the best point in this area, the one that is further in a certain direction. This is linear programming. And, uh, Linear programming was invented by Kantorovich, by uh, Koopmans, and by uh, Danzig. Two of them got Nobel Prize uh, in economics for that. The third one, no. Nobody really knows why. It's often like this. Monge, uh, pardon, sorry, Kantorovich found that this theory is extremely versatile and applies to many, many problems. Each time you have a constraint, on the resources that you can use. You don't have, you have only finite resources. And uh, one particular sub-problem that he found he could uh, encompass in his theory is the problem of transport of Monge. This is Gaspard Monge, famous uh, revolutionary mathematician, friend of Napoleon and so on. And Monge at some point asks about this problem. I have sources where you extract some material, whatever, here x1, x2, x3, x4, and I want to send it to destinations like y1, y2, y3, y4. What is the right assignment, the right matching between the sources and the targets so that I spend the least amount of work, of energy? This is the memoir of Monge, Memoir sur la théorie des déblés et des remblés, I wrote two books on that problem and it's out, outgrown, outgrowth, which is monster. Notice the interesting page number here, uh, showing already from the start that this would be a devilish subject. Uh, Monge, Monge asked the problem and did not know how to compute things in practice, of course. With the contour of each theory, and in particular with the tool he calls the duality that he introduces, you can find tools and recipes for solving it. In particular, Kantorovich shows that this problem of uh, minimizing the sum of the costs to go from the sources to the targets, that's finding the 
optimal transport cost, minimizing the price you spend, is the same as maximizing the sum of phi of y minus psi of x, where phi and psi are two functions valued in R and defined on the targets and sources respectively. How can we understand this? Here is the economic interpretation. Here I am and I want to solve this uh, transporting problem from the sources to the targets. Suppose I am a businessman, I own both the sources and the targets. These are uh, uh, mines, for instance, these are factories, and I want to see how I can send ships from here to there at lowest possible cost. But I can also use some intermediate guy, and he will take care of the transport. And he, with this guy, comes and tells me, uh, I will take care of the transport, just I will buy the stuff from you at the production site, and I will sell it back to you at the consumption site. At the end, I will sell you back what I have bought from you at the beginning. So all we have to agree on is that first, he doesn't charge too much. But this, he says, it's OK, because every time the price at the end minus the price at the beginning will be at most equal to the transport cost. So I never overcharge you because always the difference, the net difference, is bounded above by the, by the transport cost. Okay. But then we have to agree on these prices or you have to suggest the prices. And these prices are the unknowns. And uh, so this is well calibrated, not overcharging. And uh, what this theorem says is that if the transporter guy is clever, he can squeeze out from you as much money as you would have been ready to spend if you had done it yourself. You see, behind this, OK, first there is a whole theory then how to use this and so on. Behind this, you see one of the obsessions of Kantorovich, constructing a rational theory of prices. And you can imagine how dangerous this was uh, to do this in a strong ideology of a communist Russia, in which there was a strong ideology about prices that was way oversimplified compared to the Marx one. And uh, of course, it was forbidden to tell about such a theorem in public. That's another common point between Mosh and Kantorvi, that they were both working on technologies, mathematical technologies that were state secrets for different reasons. For Mosh, it was the uh, uh, descriptive geometry and uh, which was considered a military secret for Kantorovich, which was this kind of theorem that was considered seditious and like a kind of justification of capitalism or whatever. Nowadays, linear programming is used everywhere. It's one of the algorithms, arguably, that are most used in optimization. Certainly, it is one of them. Here is one uh, I extracted from internet from some tutorial about it, some of the various problems that uh, you are taught how to solve using linear programming in uh, economics courses. And uh, it is uh, all kinds of problems that reduce to maximizing a linear problem, a linear quantity, a linear combination of the unknowns. So here the unknowns are the x, the c's are given under constraints which are all linear. Every time you have this pattern, you are in the realm of linear programming. And you can use one of the many uh, computer programs that's solving automatically for you. Some of them using the theory of Kantorovich. Now, this is what's the end of my third story. And at this point, you may feel that it's a very lousy talk because I gave you three different stories and there is no relation between them. On the one hand, there was the story of Riemann and the uh, fat triangles that are characteristic of positive curvature. There was uh, Mr. Boltzmann and his beautiful entropy measuring the disorder of the amount of possibilities in a gas. And uh, there was the theory of uh, Kantorovich and his obsession with uh, finding the best combination to minimize the price, to optimize, and doing this in economics. So we have geometry, there is statistics, there is economics. Three different motivations, three different techniques, three sets of people. And however, we'll see how these three fields are connected 
in a way that uh, I and other people were lucky enough to discover around in the, let's say, between 98 and 2005 or something like that. Of course, uh, it did not uh, go uh, easily like I just sit and wait and, ah, wait, there is this, there is this uh, connection. Sometimes uh, people think that in science is like a fairy tale. You wonder something, ah, you think, you think, you read, you think, and puff, you get uh, something. This is a Nobel medal or something. And uh, good, but uh, as we know, as everybody who has done research knows, uh, as is, uh, as is uh, exemplified in this writing, it's a more complicated process, full of chance and encounters and disillusions and uh, hopes and mistakes and uh, many people and so on. Uh, it's, uh, it was mentioned that I uh, tell all this in my uh, popular book that, by the way, the Italian edition is out uh, just two days ago for a small price. <laughs> and so <laughs> this, uh, in this uh, book, uh, I explain uh, everything about, uh, in a certain project, how much you err, you wonder, you feel desperate, and then hope again, you meet somebody, the mistake turns out to be right, whatever, many different things. And uh, here in this, uh, I will not describe it all for this uh, conjunction between the three theories, but just uh, insist on the power of uh, meeting between people. And my, my title was about gas, price, triangles. We saw the triangles, we saw gas, we saw price. Now I insist on men. It's encounters and interaction between human beings, uh, men and women, uh, uh, of course. Uh, it's interactions that provide uh, the new ideas. And sometimes it's a random encounter. In my case, two of the important encounters in my life uh, the first one, it was uh, Felix Otto, uh, which I met through Jan Brunier at the end of the 90s and uh, whom I, I went to spend uh, a bit of uh, time on a research project in Santa Barbara in 99. And uh, the other one is uh, John Lott. So it's an interesting story. I was uh, invited in Berkeley in 2004 as a visiting Miller professor. This, um, some of you know, this beautiful Berkeley campus and this uh, remarkably ugly mathematics building. Uh, it's the, it's the, the Lawrence Hall. It is not only ugly, it is also very badly designed. Vertical organization with people in various layers who never meet each other. And they don't have some meeting points, natural and so on. It's the worst, the worst that you can imagine. So you never meet your neighbors, you know there are all these uh, extremely good people around, but you, you never meet them. And so I was invited there. These were beautiful conditions, like I had no teaching, no research obligations, just attending a meal uh, once a week uh, with uh, other people. For that, I was paid three times my French salary. <laughs> so life was good. But but still, I was quite bored because I was sitting in my office and nothing happened. And uh, one day, this guy uh, came and knocked at my door. This was John Lott. He was visiting the Mathematics Sciences Research Institute nearby, uh, founded by, uh, by Chen, the great Chinese mathematician. So Lott was there, and uh, he uh, was visiting, and then he knocks and says, Hello, I am John Lott. Uh, uh, I do geometry and geometric analysis. Uh, uh, I read your book, I read your paper with uh, Felix, uh, and we are going to do this and that and that and this, and uh, adapt it to do a synthetic theory, blah, 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 and uh, uh, Riemannian geometry and so on. And uh, at that time, I knew close to nothing in Riemannian geometry. I mean, I knew just the basics, but had never uh, deepened it. So he made my basic education, and we carried on a research project and so on. And uh, it happened to, to work beautifully. All, everything that uh, John and uh, I discussed on that day as a possible research agenda, we found over the years to come was true. Uh, the encounter was very short, just uh, 20 minutes maybe or something. I had to rush to get my kids from school at the time, I remember. But then we continued another encounter and then uh, years of work through email. And uh, in the end came out uh, a paper which was a big hit. It came out only five years later because we know it takes time from the encounter to the publication. 
And uh, the, uh, from, I insist on the fact that if there had not been this physical encounter between the two of us, it would never have been what it, uh, what it became. So what we found out, expanded, discovered, explored, following previous work I had done with Otto, and also an important paper by Cordero, McCann, and Schmuckenschläger. Uh, and also, at the same time, we were working on this by coincidence. Theo Sturm was also working on this with a slightly different but uh, complementary and uh, related approach. This is the kind of uh, uh, concept that will give a link completely hidden between the three areas that I described. So my three stories will be related by this thought experiment behind which there is a precise theorem, which I will not give, but uh, everything I will say you can translate in a precise mathematical statement. You want to understand if you are in a world of positive curvature. It could be on the technical side, this is the Ricci, the Ricci way. But it's related to this idea of fat triangles, on average, in, in all directions. And uh, one way to discover this, instead of looking at trajectories of geodesics and how far they separate, is the following. Whenever I have a gas here with a certain density, some regions are high density, some are low density, I will order this gas to change his state into another configuration which I prescribed to. The gas will obey, but he will choose a path that costs him the least amount of work, being the integral in time of the kinetic energy, the cost. So the gas goes from one prescribed state to another prescribed state, and he will minimize the total cost. You recognize, obviously, the contour of each kind of problem. Source and target are fixed, and you minimize the transport cost. And all the way from time is zero to time is one, say along one minute, you will measure the entropy that is the disorder of the gas at each moment of time. And if that curve of the entropy, which you plot using the Boltzmann formula, so here we are in the world of statistics, if that curve is always a concave curve, then it means we are in a positively curved world. And this puts us in the world of Riemann. See here how in this single statement, the three stories are related. This was the basis for many developments. Let me emphasize that it's quite different from the usual interpretation of curvature. This would be the classical interpretation in terms of optics, thinking of uh, geodesics as light rays. Suppose we live in a positively curved world. And we are here observing a light source that is there. And uh, maybe this is a positively curved world. We see here this is fat. And uh, if we are here and try to reconstruct the light source from the rays that we receive here, we will, given the direction with which these rays appear to us, we will, uh, we will extrapolate the shape of the light source. But we will miss, we will find it larger than it is in reality because of the curvature. If the curvature was negative, we would, on the contrary, underestimate the size, the, the surface of the source. So that is what is distinctive of positive curvature. That's a classical interpretation. And now we have this completely different interpretation in French experience du gaz paresseux, lazy gas experiments, which I told you, given initial and final configuration of the gas, you measure if the entropy is a concave function of time. Uh, this was one of the main bases for the writing of my second book, Some of the Old Transport. It took me years to work on this project, 1,000 page book. So, already just from this, it, uh, this the encounter of uh, John changed my life. Uh, I mentioned that parts of the book are already outdated, in particular due to the terrific advance of the Italian school, uh, who are solving problem after problem in, the, in this business. Two final comments. Uh, how can we feel this link between the geometry and the, uh, and the statistics? Here's a possibility. You know, the picture I drew here is a positively curved picture. This means the geodesic lines will diverge first and then converge. We know they have to converge on the whole. 
but they cannot always converge because I prescribe the source and the target, so they have to diverge first before they converge. And uh, uh, in between, because we have this picture, in between the geodesics are like more spread apart from each other. That's typical of positive curvature. If the geodesics are spread apart, the gas has more space to spread. So lower density. Lower density goes well with higher entropy. It's high density that has low entropy. This is a qualitative explanation. This doesn't tell you, though, and this I find absolutely marvelous, why it is just precisely the Boltzmann entropy that you have to, to look at and not another functional based on density. This I still marvel at this. And uh, the second comment is, what it is, is it used for? It looks more complicated than the usual picture. Maybe, but it's uh, also very much uh, richer. For instance, it is using this interpretation that we were able to prove a basic open problem that was remaining in, uh, remaining in geometry, showing that the limit of spaces of positive curvature has positive curvature in the sense of Ricci. And why? Because the usual interpretation goes very badly to the limit. You want to see how uh, light sources, if you take this light sources picture, you pass it to the limit. First, uh, you don't even know how angles pass to the limit, whatever. If your notion of convergence is very weak, just metric and measure, it makes no sense, this interpretation. But here, everything makes sense. Density doesn't need any smoothness. Geodesics, maybe I don't know how to define them, but I can always define the lowest cost. This is robust. This is easy. Entropy, I can always define. No need for any smoothness. So all the elements of this definition are very robust, and that's why it gives new possibilities. I will conclude with a kind of chauvinist note, but just, you know, I have to sell my stuff. Uh, uh, Institute Henri Poincaré's goal is precisely to foster that kind of encounters, like there was between John and myself. John was there because he was the guest of MSRI. Institute Poincaré lives only on encounters. It doesn't have any permanent uh, researchers, only guests for short periods of time. Some guests come here to do some projects, some come as part of uh, some uh, big uh, theme. A uh, lot actually started to work on these kind of issues after participating in a trimester of Institut Henri Poincaré, organized by Thierry Coulon and other people. And uh, so it's uh, to remind us that even though when we discuss about science, we talk about papers, concepts, story of ideas, and so on, in the end, it's all just encounter between people in front of a cup of coffee or cappuccino or whatever. Thank you very much.